Today we continue our, our series on Proverbs. Um, to share with our working definition of a proverb, it's a short, pithy piece of knowledge or advice. Um, today's is um, in the 28th chapter of Proverbs. Proverbs is very interesting. They're grouped sort of thematically, but sort of not. Uh, because these aren't stories, you can just jump in and go. Um, so the 28th chapter has a lot to do with this particular type of wisdom, but there's also some stuff in there that doesn't. So um, really, I hope you get from this that you can just open the, the book of Proverbs and start going. You don't need any preconceived stuff. You don't, there's no prerequisite. Just go. Um, so if you want to jump into the 20th, 20th chapter in verse 13, I'm going to read it right here. You can follow along or you can go on your Bibles. That's fine, too. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds a mercy. Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper. So, as I stated at the beginning, I never make enough mistakes in my life to use my own stories for this. Um, so I want to share a story of a childhood friend. I am, I am in this story, but I am not the protagonist. So this is... A, this is on good authority here. I'm just um, a supporting actor in this. Um, <laughs> I'm a, we're going to call this person Carl um, because if you were to go to my Facebook and I gave you my, his real name, you could find him. Um, so <laughs> Carl, Carl is what we'll call him today. Carl and I, when we were much, much younger, probably 10 or 11, um, we were living in Oswego, Illinois. That's where I grew up. Oswego, when I moved there, was um, about 4,000 people. Its population today is well over 40. Uh, I think it's closer to 50,000. Um, it, it was one of the fastest growing communities in the state of Illinois. I should say it's probably the, in the state of Illinois the number one fastest growing. I think it was in the top three in the nation um, in the years that I went to high school. So there was a lot of development happening. And we found ourselves on a Saturday morning um, wandering through some construction sites, um, through places that were in different, various, various stages of their, um, of their construction. And we found ourselves on what looked like a mountain. It probably was not that big in retrospect. I was much shorter then. Um, of bags of unused concrete. And when you are a 10 or 11 year old boy and you find a mountain of anything, what do you have to do? You have to climb it. And so we got to the top and by the time we got to the top, we had noticed with every footfall was this cloud, this poof of dust, which of course was awesome. So we spent the remainder of that day hopping from one bag to the other, and creating these puffs of smoke. Um, I mean, to the point that it looked like there was a small fire in this house of like dust blowing in the wind. And by the time we left, we were like uh, Marley's ghost in, uh, in the Christmas uh, Carol. You know, from head to toe, covered in dust. Now, my parents had come to expect some sort of behavior like this, so I, it was easy for me to come home and be like, sorry, this is my bad. Um, Carl's parents, um, not so much. So he knew, that, he knew that what he was wearing in the state that it was in would be not received well. And he was concerned about that. So he had gotten home before his, you know, his parents were not around. He went downstairs stripped off all of his dirty clothes, and threw them in the washing machine that was already full of clothes, and turned it on. Because he thought, I'll get it. They'll never know. Some of you are ahead of the story already. <laughs> because when you have that much concrete dust in your clothes, and you add water, Bad things happen. 
The end of the story involves a sledgehammer and uh, breaking up the machine into pieces because it was too heavy to get out of the basement in one piece. Because, because the, uh, the clothes were more of a, well, they were always a solid, but they were much more solid now than they were before. Yeah, don't be like Carl. If you get nothing else out of this story, know this is your public service announcement about concrete dust. It's, it's troublesome. Yeah, Carl and I did not spend a lot of time together in the immediate following of that. Um, he didn't spend a lot of time with anyone immediately following that uh, little adventure. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Finding mercy. Boy, we got this idea of confession as like a scary thing or like a judging thing. Um, we as Methodists and as Protestants, we don't have that same, you know, you sit in the little box with the screen and talk to a priest like the Catholics do. But we're aware of it. We've seen TV. Um, we know this idea of very formal confession. And that comes to mind when I read this. Confessing and renouncing sins and finding mercy. What does that mean to find mercy? I think of if Carl had simply said to his parents, I got dirty today, what is the best course of action to, t to tend to this dirtiness? We'd have had a, a much less expensive climax to this story. Now, I think, I think the trouble is we confuse condoning with forgiving. When we talk about this proverb, it's not about lessening the bad. The sin is there. We have sinned. You have sinned. I have sinned. That's, that's what we do, unfortunately. To find this mercy is not to be given permission. It's not to be condoned. What it is is a releasing of shame. Are you familiar with the word shame? Sometimes we use it as synonymous with guilt, and that's a mistake. Um, the, I worked all week to the, for my perfect definition of same, shame, which is humiliation or distress caused by the knowledge of wrongdoing. And what you should, what you should notice is rational is not anywhere in this definition, because shame is often irrational. We do something small and it bothers us irrationally for years. This is me. 100%. There are little silly, dumb things that I said or did in my life that I have held on to for decades that the people that it offended or was against have well forgotten. Because this is what shame is all about, holding on to that stuff. We want to revisit King David and Bathsheba from last week. We talked about uh, King David was King Solomon's father, King Solomon who wrote Proverbs. So again, this would probably have been part of what Solomon was thinking about when he writes things like this, whoever conceals their sins. So David, as you'll remember, uh, was, was up high in the palace and looked down and from his vantage could see into the, the home of a young woman named Bathsheba, whose husband Uriah was off fighting in the war. He saw her bathing and he he had some thoughts on that and, and, and decided to call her to the, to the kingdom. And, um, and when a, a mommy and a daddy love each other very much, sometimes they make some decisions that result in pregnancy. And so Bathsheba finds herself pregnant. And that's about where we ended the story last week. When we, when we pick up the story this week, David knows that this is not a good revelation. This is like a much worse deal than having your clothes covered in concrete dust. And he knows that this is not going to go well for him. So he decides instead of fessing up, instead of confessing and dealing with this, they're going to they're gonna hatch a scheme. I'll let you know right now, in the Bible, nobody hatches a scheme that goes well. I think in life, nobody hatches a scheme that goes well. 
So what happens is they decide to call Uriah home. They say, you know, a soldier's been gone. He's going to come home. What's the first thing he's going to do? Go home and spend some quality time with his wife. Then all of a sudden, she's pregnant for a, a, an acceptable reason. Well, Uriah, and this is, I think Uriah might be the, next to Jesus, the best person in the Bible. He comes home. He refuses to go to his house. He says, if my fellow soldiers cannot be home, then I will not be home. He sleeps on the temple steps. He says, why, why am I special? Why should I get to go lay with my wife when my brothers in arms are off fighting and dying? So I will stay here. <laughs> so David, well, shucks. David's got this, this plan A that falls through. So they sit down and they come up with a plan B. And I think schemes of plan A failing was like God giving David a second chance to do the right thing. And unfortunately, David doesn't take it. What he does is he writes up a scroll and he seals it with the, uh, with a, with the seal. He gives it to your eye. He says, go back to war. Hand, give this to the, to the leaders. And then Godspeed. So he does so. And this, uh, this scroll says... Create a scenario in which there is a, a charge that nobody else does except for Uriah. And this is what happens. The generals, the generals say, we're going we're gonna to attack. And at this pivotal moment, everyone else falls back. Uriah doesn't. He goes off and he, he's killed. Because then all of a sudden, Bathsheba the widow can be married to, to David. And all of a sudden, things make sense again. This is, this is a, a great example of what it means to conceal sin. Because often the way that we conceal sin is with more sin. And it builds, and it builds. And the sins grow. I mean, all sins are forgiven by Jesus Christ, so they all have the same worth and value. But some of them impact other people's lives vastly differently. All of a sudden, Uriah is dead. David spends most of the rest of his life dealing with the guilt and the shame of this, of this decision. Instead of confessing, he buries this sin underneath worse and greater sins. Nothing good can come from covering sin. Only term calamity because that is the extent that we are talking about. We went from like a marital dispute to murder. Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. What's this word prosper mean? Prosper, to grow in a healthy way. I love that definition because it has nothing to do, when we think of prosper, we think of money. We're prospering. Our business is prospering. Our family is prospering. But it doesn't have to, to do with that specifically. It has to do with us growing and growing towards health, growing towards being complete. I wrote this down, and then I groaned at it. But I'm going to read it anyway. You have to let it go to grow. Part of why I groaned at that is my son is, is getting into Frozen a couple years later than everybody else. And the only words to the song, Let It Go, that he really knows is Let It Go. So he just walks from room to room declaring, Let It Go, Let It Go. But it's a great reminder to let it go. That's what we got to do here. We confess our sins, we own it. I guess I never got to the title here. Nope. Own it. We own it, we make it our own because it's ours anyways. We just give it a name. We say, this is my sin, and then we repent. It's a two-part process. Sometimes owning it's the more important because we can't, we can't turn from it unless we own it, unless we name it, unless we say, you know what? This was a mistake. And we're telling these things to God. This is not like a public dec declaration. We're not going to add a piece to the service where people can stand up and confess to the church. This is saying to God, God, I have sinned. And we define sin as things that create distance between us and God. 
So I've done that. I've done this thing that creates distance between us. And I wish I hadn't, but I did. That's what owning it looks like. And then we have this thing, renounces or repents. The term repent um, means to turn toward. And this idea that like, you can only be facing one of two directions. This is the understanding of the, of the, the Jewish faith at this time. To repent your sins. You can only be facing towards God or towards the world. And they're at opposite ends of the spectrum. So if you're facing the world, God is behind you. Think of it this way. You can make the right decision or the wrong decision. You can convince yourself that other directions are available, but most of the time they're not. It's right or wrong. And if you're making the wrong decision, you're definitely not making the right decision. It's, it's binary in this way. It's one or the other. So the idea of repenting of your sins is you, you own it, you confess that sin, and then you turn towards God, or you turn away from the sin. This isn't saying, God, I will never do this again, because that's just a ridiculous statement. You're definitely going to do it again. We sin all the time. That's, that's part of life. What it's saying is saying, God, I recognize the, the, the impact that my sin makes, and I'm going to work to try to do this less. I'm going to try to keep my eyes on you for as long as possible. Turn towards God. This is not dwelling in guilt or shame. This is understanding that God has forgiven you. And it's time for you to forgive yourself. That's what shame is. It's holding on to something that's already been forgiven. And when you think of it that way, isn't it silly? You've been forgiven. Why are you holding on to it? You must let it go to grow, to prosper. Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy, finds joy for the return. To prosper, we must own it. Confess, turn, and grow. May we prosper in spite of our sin. Let us pray.